Welcome to Portsmouth Now. I'm your host, Rob Lauer. Well, the first full month of spring is here, so it's time to get outside. Maybe work in your garden or flower bed, take a stroll through Old Town, or enjoy some of the many activities and special events that will be taking place all over Portsmouth this month. On today's show, we'll look at just a few of them. That's coming up right now on this episode of Portsmouth Now. Welcome to Portsmouth Now. If you go out walking through Old Town this spring, you'll probably notice a few sites that weren't there just a few months ago. For instance, on High Street near the Commodore Theater, you'll see a display of blackboards with these words written across the top. Before I die, I want to. Below these words, passerbys can write down what they want to do before they die. The chalk is even provided. Even if you don't stop to write anything yourself, it's almost impossible to walk by the display without stopping to read what others have written there. One block down the street, where there was once the plain brick side of a two-story building, you'll now see a huge mural showing the two children peeking out from under a curtain, looking across the rooftops right into the massive front windows of the Children's Museum of Virginia. These two pieces of art represent some of the recent projects paid for by the group Supporters of Portsmouth Public Art. This group is dedicated to making Portsmouth a more beautiful and a more fun place by installing throughout the city displays of public art. But enough of me talking. Let's hear from some of the members of supporters of Portsmouth Public Art themselves and from one of the artists whose creations can now be seen throughout Old Town. My name is John Joyce and I'm the president of the SPPA, the Supporters of Portsmouth Public Art. Hi, I'm Barb Vincent and I am the secretary of the Supporters of Portsmouth Public Art. Probably about five, six, seven years ago, uh, we were sort of had, I was on the, the um, commission for the museum uh, and arts, and um, they had a sort of like a, a think session about how to get more people into the, at the time, the courthouse galleries, and, um, and I just said, well, you know, look at it. It's an it's a old 1846 building. Uh, you can't even go up the front door. You have to go around the side. It's got a wrought iron fence with spears on the top, and you're, it doesn't seem very welcoming. I said, the last thing you would think about is an, it'd be an art. Uh, so I said, you need to get some art out there. And so they started the outdoor sculpture competition in the, which in the courtyard, which is now the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. After several years, um, John said, after seeing all these wonderful sculptures come and go, um, <laughs> we thought, gee, wouldn't it be great if they would stay? You can't help but seeing all these wonderful sculptures come and go every year and you want to sum up to stay here, but it doesn't because we don't have any money. So John called me one day and said, you know, there's, there's a couple down there that are just perfect for the Children's Museum, and that had just uh, reopened. Uh, there was this toad there that the, the kids just loved, and you see the kids go up and hug on it and kiss on it and all this stuff, like, wow. And luckily the museum, the Children's Museum, had already opened up, and I just thought it was a perfect match, so uh, I got together with uh, uh, my colleague in crime, uh, Barbara Vinson. He said, I, I, I just really want to buy it. And it's a bronze toad. And I'm like, oh, it's bronze. Bronze is usually very expensive. <laughs> We're going to have to raise some funds for that. And so we um, kind of set about uh, gathering our friends and our neighbors um, together and saying, this is what we want to do. We really think it would be an asset to the community. We think the kids would love it. It would create a great photo op. Uh, and will you contribute? <laughs> so we started this organization, um, hopefully to continue the art. Uh, and that was our first project was buying the, the toad. For years, I've been a big fan of public art. I lived in outside of Denver in the mountains for a long time. And, and uh, Denver is such a rocking art city. Uh, and they have all kinds of different art, paint, murals, sculptures, uh, music. Uh, just, it's just a really involved art city. And I just thought, 
you know, on a smaller basis, we could just do some of these things and make it more exciting for people to walk by. Even the tourists, I mean, the tourists is one thing, but even our citizens on a daily basis, I've seen adults walk by that little toad and pat him on the head. You know, so it just, it just, what we see changes us. And I think that if we can create more things that are, create communication that are uh, exciting or thought provoking, then we're enhancing the quality of life. And we have a lot of projects under hand, uh, uh, and, but we looked around and we can how many bronzes can we afford? Uh, bro you know, bronze sculptures aren't the only thing known as visual arts or public art. So we thought paint sounded like a good idea. So we had planned on uh, having a, a mural to, in downtown because everywhere you go in every city there's wonderful murals that people look up and admire and laugh and all this stuff. The mural idea is great. Um, our artist Sam Welty did one on the Cedar Grove uh, Cemetery in conjunction with Aaron Kelly for the Battle of Craney Island and he did a mural on the side of the Portsmouth Naval Museum which is spectacular. It's the history of the shipyard and so when it came time for us to do ours, Sam was the natural, and we just really wanted to, him to continue sharing his talent with us here in Portsmouth. My name is Sam Welty, let's start there. And I am an artist, I've been a professional artist um, for a really long time and own my own company for the last 10 years. It is an occupational hazard with me that anytime I'm going anywhere, I notice blank walls. It is a it is a scourge that must be overthrown. Uh, just blank walls everywhere, I need to paint something. And when I met with uh, John Joyce and Barbara Vincent to talk about various projects that could be done around town, they were really excited having done the toad that sits out in front of the museum. And then you go inside and walk around in the museum and the first thing you notice is you climb to that, the top of that staircase and look out in front of the, the beautiful windows and you see High Street going by and there's this shop and that shop and it's very beautiful and there's the toad and then there's a blank wall that's just waiting for graffiti or something worse. It seemed kind of a shame to have that ugly wall when you're standing in such a gorgeous building. Um, the city manager and the mayor, several council people had, that I had spoken to um, just privately about the public art, they had said, boy, we need to do something about that wall. We had been told that a lot of people really wanted something down there. And, and so um, since we'd already focused one time on the, the Children's Museum, we thought, well, it would be nice to have a, an additional thing there. It, it's very non-controversial. Uh, we're covering an area that people don't like. And um, so it did take some time to come up with an idea as well as getting permission from the, the, the city, permission from the, the owner, who, who was awesome about uh, helping us out, and, uh, and then, of course, raising the money. Because the wall was so long and white already, we came up with the idea of what if there is a curtain? What if the wall is not a wall? It's a curtain, and there's kids lifting it up and peeking through at you, because kids like to play hide and seek. So that idea just blossom from there and John Joyce and I actually went to the museum and might have appeared a little creepy I suppose we were going around asking parents can we photograph your children for a project we're working on and of course the necessary permissions and paperwork are signed and we found uh, two families that were nice enough to have their kids pose for us and it was fun project you know you're taking pictures of kids and trying to keep their their attention hey look at me don't look over there there's something shiny you know as kids can be but uh, that, that turned into a really fun project and it, I, was, I couldn't have been happier. We have a whole series of uh, uh, projects to do. We've concentrated more in downtown because one is you get more bang for your buck, more people see it. Um, we've got a couple of more murals planned. We wanted outreach into the communities, into the neighborhoods. We really want to take it into the neighborhoods and, and, ha and help them since we are a a uh, nonprofit, we can actually help fundraising. Hopefully, they can join us, and they can come up with their own ideas. We can give them some ideas. We want them to be able to see that they can embrace it and make it their own in their own neighborhood. Whether it's creating 
iconic flags or uh, like a logo for their neighborhood or uh, create a little art fest in the neighborhood that we could assist with. Any, anything like that to em, engage all of the citizens throughout the city of Portsmouth into uh, enjoying what art can bring all of us. When we return to Portsmouth now, we'll learn how Appalachia is coming to town this spring. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov business. On Friday, April 4th, the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center will open its newest exhibit, Changing Appalachia, which will be on display through July 6. Let's find out more about Appalachian art and culture and what sort of displays and events will be part of this exhibit. I'm joined by Dr. Katie Hoffman, who is the founder of AppleWorks and also one of the uh, contributors, one of those who are overseeing helping organize the Changing Appalachia exhibit that's going to be at the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hoffman. I'm so glad to. Thank glad you. Glad to have you here. So, Appalachia, you know, you hear that and you think Appalachians and certain stereotypes, hillbillies, come to mind. I realize that's sort of viewed by people from Appalachia, now rather as a slur. Um, what attracted you to Appalachia, to the people of Appalachia, to the arts there? I moved there in 1989 from actually Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. And I said to my then husband, I'll move there, but I'm not staying. <laughs> and by the time he had finished up his school and we were getting ready to leave, I really didn't want to leave. I, we were living in Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, I've always been interested in folk music and bluegrass music mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And I found myself right in the center of it. And at about that time, I decided to stop being a banker and to go back to school and get my master's degree at East Tennessee State University. And I got very interested in the culture and the literature through the music mm -hmm. because I was already doing that. I became part of the East Tennessee State University Bluegrass Band. Mm -hmm. And um, I began working with all kinds of fabulous musicians. So I think the music I already had an interest in that, and it kind of led me into, into yeah, it? it kind of led me into having an interest in the rest of it. So now I, I make Appalachian food. I teach Appalachian literature whenever I get the chance. Um, I do the music, just anything that has to do with Appalachian culture, history. We you know certainly Appalachian music. We're all familiar with that bluegrass and all that. You mentioned Appalachian literature. Now yes. people think of literature, they think of books, poetry, Shakespeare. Right. So. Appalachian probably doesn't come to most people's minds, going along with the stereotypes of Appalachia. That's right. Can you enlighten us a little bit about literature? Sure. Um, the first, and part of what we're doing with this exhibit is trying to kind of decenter some of the stereotypes that people have that came out of initially Appalachian literature, mm -hmm. because in the late 19th century especially, there was a lot of travel writing, mm -hmm. and Appalachia was treated as a very exotic place in that travel writing. And so people would go in, and they would um, go spend maybe two days in a town, and they would have a surface level knowledge mm -hmm. of what the culture was like. And of course, anytime you go anywhere, you notice the things that are different first, and you don't really stick around to understand what's underneath, the, what really is part of the culture. So people, um, perhaps well-meaning and perhaps partly exploiting these, these beautiful places as someplace exotic to go, wrote this, this travel writing um, focusing on how different mm -hmm. Appalachia was from, say, the coast, where right. they were from. Um, so that was one of the first movements in literature that had an effect on how people saw Appalachia. Mm -hmm. The next was uh, local color writing, where people were writing in dialect and they yeah. would write the sort of the hillbilly speech out mm -hmm. um, the same way that they did with African-American speech in right. dialect. Um, and that kind of built perhaps a little negatively on the local color Well, I would think if writing. you didn't speak, that dialect wasn't natural. If you didn't communicate in that, all you could really do is lampoon it. 
right. to an extent. Right, because it was so different. And to point it up because that people wanted to read about something that was exotic or different. Yeah. Um, so I actually happen to think that Appalachian language is incredibly beautiful. The, is the, things, that, the things that people say there are um, so wise and so expressive. For instance, my husband, um, who is Appalachian, and I tease him about being a hillbilly, um, <laughs> He gave his mother a, a butter bell for a gift, which is a little thing that holds butter mm -hmm. and it goes down. It's, a, it's actually a French thing, but they like to keep their butter soft on the table. And um, she didn't quite know what to make of that. <laughs> she uses it now. But she, at, at the time, she didn't quite know what to make of it. And on the way home, I said, well, I, I don't think your mother knew what to make of that. And he said, no, she was kind of like a mule at a new gate. <laughs> And I thought that was such a wonderful saying, because if you know a mule, a mule, anything that you change in that animal's environment, they're going to kind of look at it with a little bit. And they'll, and they'll get used to it, and they'll use it eventually. But they're So what I've always found is that um, there is that element of differentness, but it's, it's something to be celebrated and something to be um, sort of touted as a the way that you would expect people to speak French if you go to France. Right. You're not going to make fun of them for that. You're going to, you know, that's, that's, um, so I, I, that's, that's always been um, interesting to me. Well, what are some of the qualities that Appalachian community, the Appalachians have that maybe we take for granted or maybe we just, it doesn't enter our minds. With the stereotype, it's the hillbilly with his barefoot on the front porch of his cabin with a shotgun ready to shoot any strangers who right. come along. Right. Very individualistic. Is that at all like the reality? No. Okay, what's the reality? Well, I think there are people like that. Oh, certainly, as you have. But in every there are people culture. like that here. Exactly. Right? So, my experience of Appalachian culture, and especially through the music and that sort of thing, is that it's very collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, from early times when people got together to build barns. Um, the women got together to make apple butter. I mean, you didn't want to peel that whole pile of apples by yourself and then cook them down, so people got together in a group and did it. Mm -hmm. You could raise a barn in a couple of days if there were enough people working on it. And the music, I think, is a wonderful sort of metaphor for the rest of Appalachian culture, because when you are in a, whether it's an old-time string band, mm -hmm. which is sort of a traditional Appalachian way of playing music, or whether you're, you're in a bluegrass band, you're paying attention to what the other people are doing. You're, you're working together. And not only that, but you're coming together. Yeah. And that's always been a, a tradition. I think the, uh, the image of the person with the shotgun on the porch, um, unfortunately, I think sometimes Appalachians have been exploited by people from outside the region. So people who go in who... Um, aren't as respectful as they should be of the culture or maybe who aren't approaching it with an open mind, get that sort of unfriendly, um, suspicious reaction because it's natural when people have come in and exploited your culture right. and made fun of you. you it's natural for people to, to wonder what somebody's um, um, motives are in coming in. So in closing, what is your, what do you hope people take away from the Changing Appalachia? exhibit here. One of the things that I've noticed about Appalachian culture that I think, if I had to sum it up in one word, um, would, is innovative, mm -hmm. um, which is not, I think, what people necessarily think of. Appalachians can take a little bit and make it into something amazing and beautiful and functional. And what we're trying to do here is to get people to rethink what they think they know mm -hmm. about the region. They think they know Appalachia, but what they don't know is the depth and the breadth of the kinds of fine art and amazing music, um, literature, all kinds of really cutting edge culture mm -hmm. that has come out of this custom. So what we're trying to do is show people how all of these cutting edge things came from deep roots and custom. But how, for instance, you take a quilt that used to be made out of homespun and now there are quilts that are art. They're, they're never meant to grace a bed. They're right. to hang on the wall 
and to be a reflection, just like all art, of the human condition. Um, so what we hope to do is help people understand Appalachia in a new way so that maybe they'll be curious and maybe they'll want to go and visit. And at the very least, when they see a show on television like Appalach Appalachian Outlaw, <laughs> um, they will understand that there's a whole uh, beautiful positive side of the culture that that is ignoring that that's not really the story. There's more to it. There's a whole lot more to it than that, that, that often doesn't get um, shown. And so we're very excited to be able to show this very colorful, very imaginative, very creative and innovative side of Appalachian culture mm -hmm. that comes from a deep custom. But it's, it's, they, they take things and they take them in their own direction and they're just amazing people and amazing artists. So that's what we're looking forward to being able to show. All right, well thanks for dropping in today and telling us about Changing Appalachia. Well thank you, thanks. appreciate it. We'll look at more special events taking place in Portsmouth this spring right after these messages. Looking for these? You drive buzzed, it could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Portsmouth Now. The Garden Club of Virginia has been sponsoring Historic Garden Week since 1929. Since then, the tours offered during Historic Garden Week have raised over $17 million, all of which goes to fund the restoration and preservation of historic gardens throughout the Commonwealth. This year, this home and garden tour will be held here in Portsmouth on Saturday, April 26, and it will feature seven private homes and gardens in the Green Acres section of the city. Um, hi, I'm uh, Jan Meredith. I'm the chairperson of the uh, historic Garden Week for the Elizabeth River Garden Club. I'm Linda Dickens and I'm chair of the Garden Tour and I represent Nansman River Garden Club. Historic Garden Week is uh, known to be the largest open house in America. For eight days or a full week, um, over 250 beautiful homes and gardens are opened across the state and um, it is sponsored, the statewide tour is sponsored by the Garden Club of Virginia. The um, date of our tour in Portsmouth is Saturday, April 26, and the time is 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the place is Green Acres. The title of our tour is Green Acres, The Place to Be, which I think is a really neat um, title. It's a catchy. We chose this neighborhood because of the beautiful treed streets, the numerous waterfront properties, and also um, the diversity of architecture in the neighborhood. We have um, a variety of homes, um, the colonial uh, to the transitional, um, and we have a mid-century ranch. Uh, most of them are on the water and they take advantage of the view, as you can see in the background here. And it also has a wonderful kind of a quiet family atmosphere that is very appealing. It's really a gem of Portsmouth. I've been in a, in a garden club for about probably 10 or 15 years. I have been involved in it as long as I've been a member of the Elizabeth River Garden Club. And that's been about five years. And prior to that, um, I was a guest and I really enjoyed the tours because it's a wonderful way to see uh, the neighborhoods. What is, makes our tours so uh, unique is that we do these beautiful flower arrangements and they are uh, designed for just for the specific room and the house that they are in and that's what normally people ooh and ah over. Wow. We show off what we can do as, as designers so it's our time, you know, it's our time to, to create um, unique flower arrangements and set off the house and um, give the people um, a show that come in and give them a reason to come. They see the houses and they see the beautiful flower arrangements. And they're not 
you can't go to a florist per se and do and see or buy what we do. We create for a particular area, for a particular home, for a particular room. Every year you work on the garden tour. It is a must. They tell you the week of garden tour. And then you know to cross that off in your calendar and not plan on anything except doing that tour. Because you know you're going to have to find flowers, you're going to condition them, and you're going to make an arrangement, you're going to work, you're going to do something. Uh, where it's going to sit, the color of the room, if there's a theme that runs through the house, how large you're going to make it, where you're going to find the flowers, whose yard are you going to sneak their flowers? <laughs> because you're always looking for flowers, you're always looking for greens. And so what we do is we all share, because we're all looking for certain things. So that week of garden, but right before the garden tour, we're going out in, in each other's yards, uh, cutting greens, conditioning them, finding the flowers. Some flowers we do order. Um, some years are just that way. But um, then we condition them, and then we come in the day before. We create our arrangements, and then the next day, the show goes on. There is lunch. Lunch is served um, at the Green Acres Presbyterian Church, and the lunch is from uh, 11.30 to 2 o'clock. Lisa Ziegler of Gardner's Workshop is going to be in the church doing a demonstration at 11 and I believe 1.30, and then um, she has seeds, she has flowers, she has equipment, tools, techniques, so that should be a fun program, you know, at the church. All our locations are River Star homes. That's a initiative from the Elizabeth River Project. Mm -hmm. And um, the Garden Club of Virginia is a really an advocate of environmental issues. And so for our homeowners to pledge to improve the quality of our beautiful river is just Wonderful. So you'll see, if you can see, this beautiful flag is going to be in front of everyone's home showing that they are uh, concerned uh, about the river and wanting to make it swimmable by the year 2020. All the monies that uh, the proceeds from the tour goes uh, directly to preserve and restore the historic gardens of Virginia. 100% goes to, to these, the gardens. And um, I highly recommend picking up a um, guidebook which talks about the different restoration sites uh, in, in the state. And the most uh, famous ones that we all know is like Mont Montpelier, Mount Vernon, um, monies go towards that. But we also have a local um, uh, restoration site here in Portsmouth which is the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center in Old Town. Make a plans to come on Saturday, April the 26th, 10 o'clock. And don't forget to get your tickets at Green Acres Presbyterian Church. On Saturday, April 26th, Green Acres will be the place to be. Now in previous years, tickets for the home and garden tours could be purchased at any of the homes being featured. But this year, tickets can only be purchased at Green Acres Presbyterian Church on Saturday, April 26. You can find out more about the day's events by picking up one of these books, Historic Garden Week, at the Portsmouth Visitor Center on the waterfront in Old Town. These books are free to anyone, and they have over 200 pages of event information, history, and photos of past Garden Week tours. And while you're out about the spring, why not check out Portsmouth's newest museum, the Portsmouth Colored Community Library. Located at 904 Elm Avenue, the museum is a treasure trove of displays on black history and the civil rights movement. If you love nature and the great outdoors, you have to visit Hoffler Creek Wildlife Preserve in Churchland. And if you'd like to support the preserve while feasting on some James River oysters, be sure to come out for the first annual Hoffler Creek Wildlife Preserve Oyster Roast and Toast, which will be held on April 29th from 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Women's Club of Portsmouth, 304 Sycamore Lane. Tickets are on sale right now, so call 757-686-8684 or visit hofflercreek.org. These are just a few of the dozens of events taking place all over the city this month. To find out more about any of them, simply log on to www.portsvaevents.com and then come to Portsmouth, where if you give us a day, we'll give you a vacation. I'm Rob Lauer. Join me next time for another episode of Portsmouth Now.